Dear friends, from our place here in Windsor, Ontario, we're reaching out to all of you, near and far. Uh, it's been sort of a matter of sadness for us in recent weeks, and especially now as Christmas comes, that because of the pandemic lockdown, we're not able to have services here in our church. But we're so grateful to God uh, for the fact that we have this technology that enables us to reach, uh, as we're aware, not only uh, over blocks and laneways, but also over boundaries and oceans uh, into many parts of the world. And we greet all of you who are watching us this night for the great festival of Christmas. Of course, that gladness pales in comparison to the good news that God has brought to us in the announcement of the uh, arrival of his son in the flesh. And that's what we want to really focus on as we gather around word and prayer and song this night and wish you his blessing as we do that. the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to, to the, the Father, and to, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, King who comes to save us. From Psalm 96, 
O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Glory, Glory be, be to, to the, the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for Christmas Eve, the Nativity of our Lord, is from Isaiah chapter 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The epistle is from St. Paul's letter to Titus, chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke in the second chapter. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, my God. 
Grace be multiplied to all of you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text which is the basis for our thoughts uh, is the epistle that was read a little bit earlier from Titus in the second chapter. We want to repeat just that first verse again, verse 11. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people. Now let's pray. Oh, the joy beyond expressing, when by faith we grasp this blessing, and to you we come confessing that your love has set us free. Gracious child, we pray, O oh, hear us. From your lowly manger, cheer us. Gently lead us and be near us till we join your choir above. Amen. In the name of the Holy Christ, child, adored by saints and angels, my dear and treasured brothers and sisters, all of you, COVID-19 is not the biggest problem that is facing the human race right now. Do not misunderstand me. It's a serious threat. And yes, it very obviously is going to affect government decisions and the private conduct of people all over the world. But if the vaccines work and if they get delivered uh, as time goes by, we're all hoping that the crisis will pass. And I could well imagine that it could happen on a future Christmas Eve that you won't think any more about COVID at all. Our biggest problem runs a good bit deeper. That problem is that something very fundamental has gone wrong inside of people. You see it every day, for example, when you switch on the news. Crimes get committed, computers get hacked, public officials very often unfairly make a big deal of an opponent's failures and just as unfairly gloss over their own in forgiving silence. You see it in yourself, if you're honest, your impatience with other people, your quickness to seek your advantage and often giving rather little thought to what might be of help to somebody else, your attempts to hide the rather ugly side of yourself, and yet at the same times to be quite vocal about the things that you're proud of, your broken promises that you have made to yourself to overcome certain besetting sins and weaknesses. And by the way, if you find all of this kind of hard to listen to, please know it's all true of me too as I have to admit to my shame. The fact that something has gone fundamentally wrong inside of people, including you and me, is what moved God to send his son this night to be born into our world as a child. Government action and medical vaccines may very well change our COVID problem, but it takes no less than God's Holy Christ child to change you. And that's what we want to spend a few minutes pondering together this holy night. This Christ gives you the power to turn around. We all know that people ought to change in significant ways. The words of scripture that we have in front of us tonight are part of a letter that the Apostle St. Paul wrote to his friend, a pastor named Titus. It was Titus's job to get out to the island of Crete and to plant the Christian church in that place. Paul realized that this work was not going to be particularly easy because the people on that island could be pretty tough customers, he told Titus. We know that fact of the world around us too, don't we? Most of all, you know it about yourself, as St. Paul knew it about himself, and as I know it about myself. And the mere fact that somebody might be able to come along and publish codes of conduct and tell you what's right and wrong by itself doesn't fix that problem. Even God's Ten Commandments, which are holy and right and true, don't fix the problem. They can make you feel guilty about your wrongs, and they can teach you so clearly that there are times when you'll do the right thing because you kind of feel obligated to do it, not always because you very sincerely want to do it from the heart. And other times, 
those same standards about what's right and wrong will fill you with frustration so that you're just kind of tempted to throw up your hands and say, well, I can't help it and nobody's perfect and I'm only human and to kind of give up the fight. I'm here tonight above all to make clear about what Christmas really is. Christmas is not just about kindness and acts of human charity, although I think we all agree that's a wonderful thing. It's not at least about having this one season in the year when we can fill our eyes up with pretty decorations and our ears with dreamy songs so that we get this little hopeful feeling only to have it dry up sometimes when you get to January with another long, cold, gray Canadian winter facing you. Christmas is not just about the gifts of closeness and of family, even though those things can be extremely heartwarming. Christmas is not even about how Jesus, as a great religious teacher, knows how to make right and wrong clearer to you than any other religious teacher, or that he came to promote high-sounding ideas like love and joy and peace. That's not really the heart of it either. The heart of it is that Jesus Christ is God's rescue. He's God's rescue with arms and legs on it. He's God coming into our fallen world as a man, where people would be able to see him and hear him and touch him. St. Paul says it this way in tonight's Bible reading, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people. So God's grace, his undeserved love, is not just a concept, it's not just a theory or an idea. God's grace, his undeserved love, became a man in Jesus Christ. God's grace penetrated our world in the most concrete way you can imagine in Jesus Christ. God's grace brings salvation. That means rescue, because that God-man Jesus did all the things that you and I needed him to do. He took our flesh and blood and lived under the demands of God's law willingly, as you and I should always be doing, but so often have utterly failed to do. He grew up then and loaded onto his own back the punishment that would have destroyed us forever. He carried it, all of it, every day, through every step that he took, from that lowly manger of his in Bethlehem all the way to a blood-spattered wooden cross up there on Skull Hill where he died for the sins of the world and did it also as your personal substitute. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people, starting as a helpless child, for real, in a town that you can still find on the map. Jesus doesn't just speak about salvation or explain to you how you can kind of earn it for yourself if you just strive and sweat hard enough. No, he brings it to you. He reaches over and presses that rescue into your hand as a finished product, as a complete gift. No home assembly or batteries required. And with all of that, Jesus Christ does something else. He doesn't only lecture you that you should say no to a godless life and a life that's driven by the world's passions. He actually can place inside of you a beating heart that wants to go his way, a beating heart that wants to say no to ungodliness and to the world's passions because you want to be his for the simple reason that he on this holy night so long ago came to earth to make himself yours. That's what has come to us at Christmas. It's more than greenery or family reunions. It's more than dreamy music or nostalgic memories from your personal past. The angel in the night sky over Bethlehem, we heard his voice in tonight's gospel reading. He said what it all meant. I'm bringing you good news of the one great joy that's going to be for all the people. For today, a Savior has been born to you in David's town, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. So the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to people. He's there for everybody who wants him, for all those different groups of tough customers that St. Titus was getting ready to work with there on the island of Crete, for all the billions of people 
who are inhabiting our world today, for all of those people that you personally find it very, very easy to like, <laughs> and in addition to that, all of the ones that totally turn you off, and he's there for you. Your mistakes, your shortcomings, your bad attitudes about so many things, your broken promises, all the things about yourself that you try to keep other people from finding out. He saw it all, and none of it kept him away from you. That Christ, who's given you the heart to come to him and to turn around, also knows how to shape your character. You know, we hear plenty in our days about things like self-fulfillment and realizing your potential and asserting yourself and making sure that you get what you figure you've got coming to you. I guess all of that has a place, but our world sometimes, you get the feeling, has almost turned these goals into little gods, you know, that trump everything else. And the broken pieces, the failures from turning these kinds of goals into little gods are lying all over the floor around us. There's hard selfishness when what I figure I've got coming to me collides headlong with what you figure you've got coming to you. Conflict where one group in society behaves like its grievances are the big thing that really matters, but may make rather little room for some other group that figures, no, it's our grievances that aren't getting enough attention or enough government funding or enough justice or enough recognition. It's actually not such a great wonder that not only churches, but a lot of volunteer organizations, you know, like the Legion and parent-teacher associations and a whole host of other service groups can have a tough time nowadays finding the helpers they need in an environment like the one that we're creating with that mindset. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. God's holy Christ child helps you with every bit of that. He can give you the heart, first of all, in relation to yourself, to get beyond self-indulgence and to live the much more liberating way of self-control. In relation to other people, he can give you the heart to stop so much pushing and shoving and to handle other people with real honesty and sincere concern and with fairness, even when your fairness might benefit them at a given moment more than it does you. You and I can live that way. Not because you're looking for a reason to brag and not somehow to prove that you're better than other people, but because God's holy Christ child is moving you forward. You are not aimless. This Christ has set a goal both for himself and for you. And St. Paul here in the epistle puts it like this. He said, we live in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, I'm running out of time to tell you everything that I want to say about all of this. But the true God really has given you a blessed hope, not a hollow hope, not a hope that's going to turn into big fat disappointment later on, but a hope that actually has his blessing resting on it. Some of people's typical Christmas hopes fall flat. Maybe you've already noticed this in years gone by. The hopes that we're always talking about for peace among nations or more goodwill among people in general or ever-growing kindness often turn into little more than a bunch of wishful thinking. Jesus Christ hooks you up to a blessed hope, the one that has God's blessing and his promises all over it. And that blessed hope is simply this, that the Christ who came into our flesh at Christmas a long time ago, who lived and who died and was raised again to buy your pardon, who ascended on high and now sits at the Father's right hand, is going to appear again. You don't know when, and I don't either. The early Christian believers were mistaken because many of them were completely convinced that this was going to happen within their lifetime. I would say, based on my own observations, that Christians in the year 2020 have the opposite problem. Because the return of our Lord has been so long delayed, it's easy to sort of start feeling as if it's never going to come. But it will come. And even though even a lot of the organized church doesn't talk about it much anymore, we confess it in our creeds 
as one of our bedrock convictions, he will come again in glory to jo judge both the living and the dead. When you live as if that's true and live as if that matters, even though you don't know when it's going to be, this blessed hope breathes energy into your life when you realize that you're moving towards something really secure and quite wonderful. It can breathe endurance into your life when troubles and disappointments are threatening to wear you out. And it can breathe a real sense of purpose even into the mundane everything, everyday things that you do because you understand that the Christ who came the first time on this night long ago is true to his promise that he'll come again and he's watching over you very lovingly for all the days and months and the years until then. A lot of people from our church family have told me in recent weeks that Christmas is going to be a good bit quieter this year at their house. COVID-19 means it'll be quieter at our house too. So many of the trappings that we really love are rather painfully missing this December, aren't they? <laughs> All the way from that colossal light display, you know, at Jackson Park, just a few blocks from our church here in central Windsor, or a dining room at home stuffed full of family members crowded around the table, or even the festival services of our church on Christmas Eve that often felt like the crown of the whole year. The true God wants you to rejoice just the same, that the big treasure has already come to you since his grace that brings salvation has appeared in Bethlehem's holy child. And God's incredible Christmas gift, the power to go to work on the deepest problem that you and I have, the power to start changing what's wrong with us, that's already yours in Jesus Christ and the rescue he brings. So a happy, holy Christmas to you, dear friend. That's what I wish with all my heart to all of you, wherever you happen to be. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Let us pray as our Lord and Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. O God, you make this most holy night to shine with the brightness of the true light. Grant that as we have known the mysteries of that light on earth, we may also come to the fullness of his joys in heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. O oh God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.